it is interesting how things develop, and I think that, that, that sampling has gone from being this um, kind of hack to just a new part of business, really, and, and, and how we interact between samples and live musicians. And, you know, when you are working on stuff which has a smaller budget, do you still try and use just one live musician? Do you feel that, that enhances what you do? 100%. Um... My first big television series, which wasn't my first series, but the one that put me on the map, if you will, was called The Tudors, about King Henry VIII. And I was writing on, I guess, Hansa samples at the time. There's no budget for live musicians, but I said, I'm going to hire one person on every show, or maybe two musicians. And it cost me uh, $1,200 or something like this. So there would be a violinist I use all the time. Michael Levine is not here, I don't think. He's a good friend. And a woodwind player. And what I would do is, this is funny how this evolves, I put a limiting effect on it so it would bring this live musician way forward in the sound field. I put reverb and delay and a, some lipstick and a hat and gloves and <laughs> fancy boots so all you heard was this live musician because my programming sucked and the samples weren't quite there yet. And it became my sound for that show was this really hyped up engineered solo musician, whether it be the woodwind or whether it be a cello. Uh, it was just me grasping for something to make it sound musical because the samples weren't there yet, we didn't have vibrato and a fader like I do now, and I wasn't very good at programming yet. It was just, just trying to make it work somehow. So to answer your question, that began the beginning of always having a live musician whenever possible, and composers are great, at least my friends are, overspenders of their pa pack package budget on live musicians, and it's a uh, full circle to writing on computers for computers versus writing on computers for live musicians. In my Hans time, we did a movie called uh, The Ring, which by his definition was low budget. And so he hired only Chelly, 24 Chelly, I think it was, and eight basses, and had this glorious sound at Lindhurst Studios because it fills the room. Fast forward to my movie I just finished called Hunter Killer. It's a dark subterranean submarine movie. And I heard that sound in my head, and sure enough, Spitfire actually has a library. It's a bit of an oldie goldie, isn't it? I see me. When was yeah. That? Uh, mid midlife crisis. crisis. <laughs> uh, so I, what I got to do was pull up this patch, which is, I think, 24 celli and six or eight bases, and write for the musicians in the configuration, in the room that it's going to ultimately be recorded in. I mean, how great is that in terms of having the tool to really realize your idea in a way that you can sell to the director first, but also know that it's actually going to sound remotely like that, only better, of course. So I, I'm always seeing that particular room in my head um, when I'm writing, and uh, which is why I love your library so much. But TV is the new film, would you, would you agree? And it's like now you're doing a telly series, and you are absolutely kind of smashing it at the moment. And, and uh, how have you kind of, how has that changed your kind of experience of things? Uh, I was really born in the, into my career right at that, uh, you know, when the needle was tipping switch. Uh, switch. I got my first television series, I was working with Hans at the time. And at that time, he, and the industry, I would say, very much looked down upon TV as, you didn't make it in film, but let me pet you like a small child, you can do this little TV show, and <laughs> very much felt like that at the time, too. Uh, fast forward, that I, I think that the Tudors, along with uh, the Sopranos and Six Feet Under and the birth of the cable network, which now has just gone all the way to Netflix and owns the world, at the time, that was new, you have to realize. Now, if you think about it, why become a movie maker? Why watch a movie? Why invest your two hours as an audience? Because you want to be told a great story. The best stories being told are all on TV, with a rare exception on movies. Movies, I think Steven Spielberg uh, projected, and I agree, that the split for movies is it will be like Broadway. You'll spend $100 on a ticket to see the Avengers, and you'll have dinner and a movie, and they'll bring you wine in your seat, and your seat will vibrate, and other <laughs> things like this. Uh, that will be the, the tentpole movie, and then leave the repertory theater doing reruns of Pulp Fiction, there'll be nothing in the middle, because all the middle has gone to television. What they realize is, as storytellers, there's such an incredibly deep, long arc and character development you can do in episodic television that you cannot do in movies. The character development over the course of a season is so much deeper and so much richer. It's not just filling 22 episodes with Crime of the Week, although that's great, and I have respect for that, that's what my mother would watch, or that generation. But now we have House of Cards, or pick the thing you're into. You're so invested in these characters for years. 
So storytelling is at an all-time high. Now all the actors are going, wow, all the guys are winning awards are all in television. Now the entire wave is moving this way. Artistically, not 100%, but for the most part, the most rewarding opportunities are in television. I find one of the biggest challenges of the multi-episodic system is that you are, you know, with film, it's a very linear process. With a multi-episodic, you can be splayed across maybe three, four episodes, three, four parts in the production process. And I'm, I'm, I know that you've got your chops and you're, you're used to it, but how do you cope with that? I think it's um, a conversation about art versus craft. You know, art or talent, for lack of a better word, which I'm not a huge fan of that word, but there's something innate in us to be able to create music. It's just true. However, what you do with it and how you learn to cope with challenges is craft. You're not born with, the, no one's born with the ability to handle multiple deadlines at the same time. You learn it. So I kind of learned it one step at a time and learned that, uh, and I say this all the time, it's a little cynical, but it's what I believe. At the end of the day, the reason I get hired back is more because I service my clients than I wrote great music. If I didn't write good music, they wouldn't hire me back at all, so it has to be good. And I shoot for the, you know, as high as I can every day. But no one loves a cue that was two days late. So in a way, dealing with the insane deadlines or the inane requests for notes at midnight for the 9 a.m. dub is the job. And you can't say, that's unfair, and you're not treating me properly, and they'll go, great. And uh, I think Christian's available to do your next <laughs> episode of TV. So I think that... Uh, Learning your craft is not just about learning to use a sequencer or using sample libraries, it's about politics, about dealing with clients, about getting that call at midnight and the dub's at 8 a.m. and you deliver and they call and say, hey, thanks. You say, you know what, you're welcome, but just so you know, you fucking jam me up, man. You know, I'm up all night on this. You could have given me the notes. I gave you the episode three days ago. You say this nicer than I'm saying it. And they go, okay, a little respect. You deliver, then you push back a little bit and you find that equilibrium, but sometimes it's just nuts and there's nothing you can do about it. You know? In film, you have this kind of the spirit of the auteur, the director, being the kind of the Sauron. Whereas in TV, certainly in the UK, the producers really uh, are more... <laughs> powerful is the wrong word, but there isn't that... It's, it's a very different dynamic. I don't know if that's something I, you... I agree. I think I'm going to modify my experience a little bit to say the director is the auteur, but they're generally surrounded by a handful of studio executives to keep him, he or her in the zone. They can't go completely off the rails. But, however, in television, I never meet the director. The way it works is, unless it's a pilot where they're setting the tone, they direct, they do the director's cut, which is the first cut of four. So it goes director's cut, producer's cut, network cut, final cut. Which cut means basically the director goes, here's my edit of what I think it should be, here's some tech music thrown in, and I'm out never to be seen again. By the time I parachute in, they're long gone. Even at the top? Even at the top. There it's not. So I'd never have any feedback from the director unless it's someone I've worked with before or it's a pilot. So by the time I get there, it's studio, uh, executive producers, plural. Um, it's very much not a director-driven thing. So that committee approach that is television is another craft to get used to because there's multiple voices. Early in my career, I would get two notes from two different people that completely, completely I mean, utterly, uh, oppose each other's point of view what to do with the cue. It should be brighter, this should be darker, it should be happier, it should be sadder. And you're, all, you're in the dark in the studio, literally in the dark, going, what do you do? And you're so afraid to speak up because you're young in your career. Now I'll pick up the phone or send an email and say, A, going forward, we have some kind of curate the notes and funnel them down and organize them in some way that I have one person's point of view. And I feel confident in asking that now because I've been in the business long enough. But, but at the beginning, I didn't know how to deal with it, so I'd write both and say, kind of, I hope you guys can work it out amongst yourselves, because I didn't know how else to do it. Something I believe, I may be wrong, that you may have experienced, is this, this funny obsession us composers have with proving our success through basically killing ourselves. And I, I've been really struck this year by, we've lost two members of our fraternity, for whatever reasons, they, they've gone too soon. And I was really looking forward to new work of these two, two chaps, and it's really, it's really done my head in. I know that, I, I have a feeling that you, you, you've experienced that, um, that thing of just, you're only successful in the, in the view of other composers and yourself, if you're killing yourself. Do you have any thoughts on that? 
I do. Um, there are some sad losses this year, and uh, you know, I went into the studio when I was 19, and I came out when I was 30, 11 years later. Then moved to LA, went into Hans Zimmer's store, came out five years later. And what do you think happens in the middle? No one's walking or exercising or eating properly, and no one talks about this stuff. Uh, and we should. A. B. Uh, uh, during my time with Hans, he was a. You worked his hours, and he was a late worker, and. My typical day would be um, get up at 11, uh, pick him up at noon, drive to the studio, we'd fuck around till dinner, and then we'd actually get to work around 7 or 8 p.m. We'd work till 3 or 4 in the morning. I lived in Silver Lake, which for you uh, is over here, and the studio is in Santa Monica. And then we'd finish around 2 or 3, and then we'd tell stories till 4, and the sun looked just like that, only going that way, uh, for five years. Seven days a week. 359 days a year. That was my life for five years. That's just the way, and he's obviously changed the landscape of film composing, so I'm not judging his work ethic, but when I emerged from that and I started to find my own point of view and I met my wife, Zoe, you're here with me tonight. Thank you for supporting me, Zoe. Um, and then uh, I'm answering your question in the roundabout way, but I'm getting, I'm getting there. And then from there it becomes you know, working for someone else is their point of view. I'm finding my own point of view. I had my first television show. My needle was moving this way. I started to become happier, and I started to realize, much to my surprise, I'm not a night owl by nature. I just had been for a long time. And then I had a family, and now I really, really work banker's hours. I work six days a week. I work seven days a week sometimes, but I work 8.30 to 5.30 or 6. That's it. And if I get to the 6 o'clock mark, and I'd having got to where I need to get to, I'll get up at four o'clock in the morning the next day, make coffee and get in. So my lifestyle has found a way to be much more in balance. I don't procrastinate in the studio, I don't fuck around, you know, I don't post to Facebook that often, you know? Uh, but I, I, it's a choice, I think, is the point. I, I choose not to go into the place where I'm working myself to death. Because I did it for a long time, and there is a theory out there in the business, and it's a very polarizing one, and people believe in it, wholeheartedly or not, which is you do your best work when you're just crawling on all fours and the dub is in four days and the orchestra session's coming and they're throwing shit out and they're, the producers or the directors or the composer you're working for is making you work just until there's no blood left in your veins. That's when you do your best work. And although those moments do happen on occasion, as a rule, I don't agree with it. No, I, I, I don't agree with it. I don't think that if, you know, if you're my composing assistant and, I, you know, and it's not needed, and you're working around the clock, you're doing better work because you're up late. The work's gotta get done, I get it. But especially being creative, for me what I've learned is I have a very, very sharp attention span that lasts about eight hours, maybe nine. 10 is, it's already on the decline. So Mine's 45 minutes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, going with the dark theme for a moment, um, I, as part of my craft, my journey, um, completely personal to me. I did the heavy lifting for 10 years in Toronto. I was in the engineering and production business. I was in the studio for 10 years, seven days a week. Then I worked for Hans for a very long time, for very long hours, and that was that experience. And now I've come out of it and I found what works for me. I'm not preaching, I'm just telling you my own experiences. I don't do my best work, push to the limit every day, all the time. Is there something that you could say to yourself 10 or 15 years ago, hindsight? You know what? I don't know why I would have listened, to be honest. Um, sure, but, but what would you say? I would say I'm a Gemini, so I had this great swinging pendulum in my life <laughs> in big and small increments. I would say look for balance. I would say uh, breathe more fresh air, uh, walk places, hike, ride a bike, do something to get your body moving, uh, eat better. Um, those little things that you can do while you're still doing your career. There's no doubt and this will be in my vlog as well, that it is a crushingly hard amount of work early in your career. And the more that Berkeley and the schools put out composers who want to be in this business and want to come to LA, the more competition there is, the upside is there's more work to be done, so that's good for you guys. Um, it's a highly competitive field. Think of the composer who jumps to mind whose career you admire, or someone whose career you'd like, I wouldn't mind his or her career. I'm telling you, they work way harder than you think they do. Way harder. I would probably say to my younger self, try to find a little bit more balance instead of this. You can be all in, but you have to be without being all in. Yeah. 
Thank you so much, Trevor.